pray and then we'll have a look in God's word. Thank you, Father God, for um, the words of that song all through the storm. You are like our anchor. You are our hope. Uh, we don't try to hold on to anything else, Lord, because uh, if we do, we will just sink. Uh, we hold on to you because uh, we know that you are our rock. Uh, you are our solid reference point. Uh, we hold on to you because we know uh, that outside of you and apart from you and away from you, we, we can't make it. We, can't, we are unable to finish the race. We are unable to keep the faith outside of you and apart from you we can do nothing everything we have the platform the opportunities everything that we have we have it because of you all that we are is because of you everything to this point uh, is because of you lord we were reminded yesterday as we met together as a leadership that you are in the center that you hold all things together every area of our lives are connected to you we also know, Lord God, and we're excited about the plans that you have for us, plans to prosper us, not to harm us, but to fill our lives with hope and the future. And so we take heart in that, Lord. We take hold of that. And while our feelings are going up and down, we hold on to what we know is true, that you are the living God, that you are real, that you are here, that you are in the midst of us, that you have uh, a journey that is filled with challenges, yes, hardships and difficulties yes but it leads to glory it leads to everlasting life and in that we put our hope we put our hope in you we give you thanks and as we have had that time to worship and to reflect and to think we just want to take a little time now just to to look at your word and just to take something out which we can chew and digest and and, and nourish our, our spirits lord god and keep us going um, on another day i give you this time in Jesus' name. Amen. There are times when <clears throat> I feel like I could just sit down and just listen Hi. to you play <laughs> all, all day. It's, it's beautiful. It's a wonderful ministry. Thank you. Thank you, worship team. Um, today's subject is it's going, to be, it's going to be short because I would like us to do something after. But this just sets the scene for why we're going to do the other thing after. And um, I've entitled this um, short talk, sermon, and message, Maturity, Preparing for the Next Level. Maturity, when I looked at maturity and its definition, um, it just simply said, uh, fully grown, developed. It's the natural outcome of every type of organism, be it animal, plant, insect, or human. It's interesting, we don't give it a second thought when we look at the child, that that child is going to go from a baby to a toddler to an infant to a junior to a teenager and an adult. We don't give it a second thought, we just think that's the natural process, and it is a natural process of development. I remember, um, and we still do it from time to time, look at the pictures of our children. We got three books and um, little photograph albums. Uh, one for Sammy, one for Calvin, and one for Dylan. It's amazing, looking at Sammy uh, when she was born, um, just, just fresh, just brand new. She's there crying, her face is round, and Sandra's looking quite um, conservative and orderly after having a baby. I think it might be quite amazing. And just seeing the little baby there, and I remember one of the things that Sandra's asking, says, is she all right? I said, yeah, yeah, she's fine. All the fingers and thumbs and everything are there. She's lovely, there's no problem. A brand new child. It's beautiful. When we had Calvin, it's pretty much the same. Second time around, though, there was, wasn't that shock factor. Um, but, you know, it was still a lovely surprise just to have Calvin. And a beautiful little boy. So we had a little boy and a girl. And then another wonderful, amazing thing happened, and Dylan came along. And when we look at this picture, we, if you see some of these pictures, right, his head is so round, he's got this round head. Round, backwards, round, forwards, round, all over. <laughs> and it's still round. It's still got that little round head, even now. I look at Calvin's picture, and I see um, 
because you know his hair can get into a big afro. And in the picture, he has these plaits, and the plaits are long. And he's got this little dummy in his mouth, and he's there holding up his hands, wanting his mom to pick him up in the bathroom. He's got the long plaits. And I see um, a picture sometimes of um, uh, Dylan, and sometimes there's a, a, a freeze frame moment when he, he looks like my, my dad. I think, oh dear. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> looks like my dad. But he's got a cute look. He's got a cute look. But you know, I see those pictures and I think, okay, that's beautiful. And then I remember other things like, um, who remembers when the child, was there anybody had the children who had the dummy, put the dummy in their mouth? Yes. Yeah, you got the dummy, yeah? Remember the dummy? And then um, we would have our kids and they would love the dummy, keep sucking on the dummy. And when the dummy went missing, it was hell, man. We had to just look all over the house, and be crying and drama and all manner of different things until we found the dummy. So we made clips, there was clips, so that they would keep the dummy. And even to the point of when one of the, who was it, who bit it in half? Sam. Yeah, Sam, we bit the dummy in half, so we called it a dumb eye. <laughs> half a dummy. Okay. Little things like that, remember. Anybody remembers the nappy? Yeah. The nappy, we had the thing called the nappy bucket. Mm. My God, the nappy bucket. It was traumatic. Even now when I think about it, I begin to break out in a cold sweat. The nappy bucket. You see you kids, okay? You're carrying on like you're so big. But just remember, we wiped your backsides when you were babies. And we put those nappies in those nappy buckets. And we just put them in. I remember sealing it. You needed to seal it because they had an awful smell. You had to open the bathroom window most of the times. And when you come to empty the bins, we would empty the bins on Thursday, so... Um, Friday morning, so we had to take them out Thursday night. Man, you just took that, you just held your nose, you feel like it was a biohazard thing, you just put it on, and you get the nap, you tie it up and you put it in there, you think, you know, oh my God. But I'm just thinking, I mean, those are, those are wonderful times, they really were, I mean, thinking back, they were wonderful times, because there were times when there were little babies, and you just remember the times, I remember, um, Dylan and Calvin as li little, because yeah, Calvin would be five, so that would make Dylan one. Oh, and the cabin's about six and make Dylan two. And they would be in the room together. And, you know, you just, you just leave the door slightly open. You just look at them sleeping and you go, oh. And you just go downstairs. And that, that warm feeling inside of your heart if, you're, if you've ever been a parent or parents to children. And I remember all those moments and they were beautiful. But you know what? I wouldn't want to be really living that all the time. I wouldn't want it to be a Groundhog Day living that all the time because I would be expecting my children to grow up. I'd be expecting my children to grow up. And they have. Um, Sammy is 18, and then um, Calvin is 13, and Dylan is 9. And Dylan was lovely, and um, Calvin is lovely, and Sammy is lovely. She's a lovely, trouble little baby. But you know, they're 18 years old, they're kind of body conscious now, so she wouldn't want you, don't anybody tell her that about being chubby or anything like that, you know. <laughs> Young woman, very, very conscious, self conscious. God's expectation of us in terms of our development is exactly the same as our expectation of our own children, okay? <coughs> In the same way that we want to see our children and expect our children to develop, God expects us to develop too. Hebrews. You got it? Turn with me. Let's have a quick read. One, two. Okay. Um, Hebrews chapter 6. Okay. Verse 1. It's going to read. Uh, Therefore, let us leave the elementary, elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity. Not laying again the foundations of repentance from acts that leads to death and faith in God. Instructions about baptism, laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment, etc., etc. That's that verse 1. Therefore, let us leave the elemental teachings about Christ and go on. Let us leave something and go on. In a sense, uh, the Lord is kind of saying to us, grow up. We need to grow up. You know, I was looking at Beacon and how Beacon has been changing over the last three to five years. It's amazing to see um, that there is a great tier of people in almost every age group, from, um, like I said, from babies, toddlers, infants, etc., right to the adults. There's a, there's a beautiful tier of people, of, of, of body and energetic people in every, every age, age group. But I'm not expecting it all to stay the same. I'm expecting each person to develop and move and grow from the oldest or from the youngest through to the oldest. God's expectation is just the same. God is expecting us to grow up. 
And it's interesting because I think like spiritual um, um, growth pains is a little bit like natural growth pains. And I was reading about it, and they talk about when you have a growth spurt, your limbs begin to stretch out. And, it, and as a bone stretch, um, it stretches the muscles and it causes pain. Um, so the information goes. Spiritual growth pains are a little bit like natural growth pains. They do hurt. They hurt. And if we are living our lives expecting that there's never going to be any hurt, there's never going to be any difficulties, there's never going to be any problems, then we're living in la-la land. We are living very naively. And God didn't, never said that it wasn't going to hurt. He just says that he'll be with you in the midst of the hurt. So here we go. They hurt, and those spiritual growth pains hurt because God is subjecting those spiritual muscles to trials and tests and stretching and bending and twisting. Why is he doing that? So that he can produce perseverance. Now, I was looking at perseverance and he just simply says this, to continue in something or with something even when it is difficult. Even when it's difficult. You know, I mean, Sandra would bear this out as a testimony. A lot of the children nowadays in school, they don't really, some of them don't really try too hard because it's difficult. It's a massive challenge for them, and they give up at the first hurdle. The first obstacle, the first sign of resistance, and they say, no, no, I can't be bothered with this. They're a little bit like something that a man said yesterday. He said that some of us, we stand on the X Factor sign, and we think that we can go from the X, X Factor sign to stardom, without um, enduring or tackling the process to get there. Most of us are in this kind of an instant thing. Everything must be instant. Instant success, instant achievement, instant gratification. Everything must be like this, like yesterday. That's what society teaches us, but the Word of God doesn't teach us that. The Word of God tells us that there's a process that we need to follow in order to develop. Why? Why all this testing and twisting and trying and bending and pushing by the Lord, it is to produce something. The Lord is trying to produce something in each one of us. Maturity. God is wanting to try to produce maturity in us. You know, I think about, um, I don't go to the gym, um, but I, I, I don't go to the gym regularly. I've been a few times. And it's interesting seeing the, um, the, the folks working out. And um, they're there and all you can hear is well, that's all you can hear, you know, just as they're pumping up those weights and everything. I'm thinking, boy, that look like agony to me. I don't know about, I don't know about anything good. But they're there grimacing and they're sweating and they're trying and they're working out. We well, you know what you see them persisting. And why are they persisting? So that they can get a bigger body. That's what they're doing, is so they can get a bigger body. They're training to produce a larger muscle. That's all they're doing. You know, I know there's some Christians as well who go and they do a bit of training too. And they go there to stay in shape. Now, there is nothing the matter with staying in shape. Because even the Word of God says it, doesn't it? It says that physical exercise is of some benefit. It profits. There's a little bit of benefit for it. But spiritual exercise is so much greater because it's useful for now and through eternity. And I can just imagine many of those Christians are not going to be any different. Grimacing, straining, pressing, sweating to produce a better body and a better shape. That's very interesting, because I know that sometimes some of those same Christians will not allow God to put them through a training program to develop spiritual muscle. You need to have the muscle to be able to take the strain. That's right. You do need it. And there's sometimes there are reasons why we won't take the strain. And if you still have your Bibles, let's have a look at Luke. It's uh, Luke chapter 8. Verse 13 to 14. If anybody finds that, can they just read it out? Luke chapter 8, verse 13 to 14. I'm sure about the right one. I believe it is. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing they fall away. And 14, 13? The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on the way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, pleasures, and they do not mature. Thank you, Philip. 
I don't know if you, any gardeners here? Anybody like doing the gardening? Kind, kind of, well, some people like gardening and some do gardening out of necessity, right? I do the gardening out of necessity, okay? And <clears throat> at the side, at the side of our um, garden, when you go out through the doors, for those of you who've ever been to our home, and we've got some plants. Now, the plants look like marijuana plants, you know, which is quite interesting. That's why I often pull them out, because I'm thinking, if anybody ever comes, think, yes, elder of church, grow some marijuana. <laughs> but they, look, they really look kind of strange, and they kind of stand out. You got it? Praise the Lord. You are right, Tim? Come on now. Elder of pastor, arrested. <laughs> There's none in my garden. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, it's because sometimes the pressures of leadership means that we're going to go to new levels. <laughs> anyway, first let's move on. It's not this silly. And so the plants are at the side, and there's some bins around there, but they get big. And sometimes I find I've got to really, really pull them out. I've got to use a bit of welly. I can't just simply take them and then I've got to put the gloves on because the stem can be a bit sharp and it can just cut you. So I put the, 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 the gloves on. And then I pull them out, and because the roots are really, really embedded. I mean, you know, sometimes we need to be like those roots. We need to be embedded. And the reason why some of us don't really kind of make it is because there's no root. There's no root. So we receive the word, and it's great. We've got a service, and it's wonderful. And we're saying, praise the Lord, hallelujah. And then come Monday morning, there's a little bit of testing, a little challenge to our faith. It's not as if to say we're going to lose our lives, but someone just might make a little comment. Oh, my God. We crumble down like a deck of cards. Because the trials and the testing that comes along to test us and to, to build us up cannot be effective because we have no root. It's not enough just to be a reader of the word. You have to apply the word. And sometimes you have to apply the word in, in a context of experience. And sometimes God puts you in a context in order so that you can apply the word, so that you can persist in that application of a principle that comes from the word so that you can learn something but sometimes the reason why we don't make it is because there is no root and that's the reason why sometimes you see uh, one or two Christians sadly it does happen it does happen they're with us they're enjoying the things of God they're praising God with the rest of them and the best of them and you turn around a few months later go where are they where are they <coughs> they're gone they've, they've stopped coming having fellowship they stop reading the word and they're just outside in the world, just like the rest of them. But not the best of them. They put their hands up in the air and then they say they give up. There's no root. There's nothing embedded. And so therefore, they embody the scripture that says, those who fall on the rock are like, those who receive the word with joy. They, re they really do receive it with joy. They're not grumpy or anything. They're not resistant to the word. It says they receive it with joy. And they hear it. They hear it. They love it. It's a fantastic, beautiful word. But there's no root. So the testing comes and then they fall away. Verse 14 is another reason why um, many Christians struggle and fall. Um, life's worries and pleasures. The allure of the world. Let me tell you something about the allure of the world. It really is nice. It really is nice. And before I became a Christian, that's what I thought. It really is nice. I remember going out um, to parties on a Friday. <coughs> And I would be there at Tabasco's, Tabasco's nightclub in Aston. And then from Aston, from the Tabasco's nightclub, we'd go to a little blues and stay there until about 7 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. And then I'd come home and have a nice little rest, get a little something to eat. And then I'd be out Saturday night to stay at, at, at another nightclub again, then in town, but there's a, some fan, nice fancy clubs in town. And I'd stay there and then go to another blues on the Saturday night to get to home on a Sunday morning and then go to work. Man, I tell you, I believed then it was great. I really did believe it was great. You know? But, you know, post-salvation now, I've got to kind of have a different kind of thinking. I'm too old to kind of do those things anyway. I'm 50 years old, and I see those little kids, uh, 19, 20 years old, <coughs> just wearing a shirt, running around in town in the freezing cold. I think to, I think to myself, okay, praise the Lord, that was then, but this is now. Uh, you remember those days, really? No, no. <laughs> 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 okay, we won't reveal too much. Yes, um, 
and I remember those days, and it had a real allure to it. And I remember in, in those, those places, and the music was going, and dancing with the girls, and feeling really, really sweet. You know, they look at me, I look at them, and say, hey, you enjoyed that dance, didn't you? Hey, come on now. And I just swept back, swept back to the side, and I'm just really, really enjoying myself. And there was just that. And just the mood, and the flow, and everything of it, really, really had an allure to it. And you know, and it is, it is attractive to a point. It is attractive to a point. But you know, sometimes that allure of the world and then the cares, the concerns that people have. How am I going to cope? How am I going to deal with the bills? How am I going to deal with this challenge? How am I going to deal with this situation? How am I going to deal with this relationship? How am I going to deal with environments and different things and problems in the house and deal with my children and my health is... And the whole cares and concerns choke the faith that some people have. And by the time they know where they are, God is very, very much at the back of the house. You know, the, you know the thing about God? God is not really interested in second, you know. If it's second for God, it's last. You understand that? If it's second for God, if God is taking second place, you're basically saying that he's last. He wants the first, he wants the central place. But sometimes God ends up at the back of the queue because the worries and the cares of this life and the allure, the attractiveness of the world chokes out people's faith. The world really does, and I know this because I've been out there, the world really does at times glitter. It does. But all that glitters is not necessarily gold. We need, we need to remember that. So those are reasons why sometimes our faith gets choked. Because there's no root, and because the cares of this world causes us to put God to one side. So therefore, God cannot develop his plan in us, which is to, to develop us to the next stage, the next stage of maturity, to get to the next level. You know, I, I didn't realize this, and it's only now recently I've realized that, that if you, if you are not prepared to go to the next level, you can sing and you can dance and you can pray, you can do all of them things, God ain't going to take you there. If you're not prepared to go through his program to get to the next level, it doesn't make no difference what you do. It makes no difference what you do. I would imagine most of us, I would say all of us, unless I've got this wrong, most of us would want to see God's power at work. We want to see miracles. We want to see an outpouring of blessings. We want to be astounded by God. But you know, sometimes between all of that and where we are, there are trials and testing and shaping in order to get to that place. Sometimes we adopt that principle, don't we? We say, if we can get a little quick fix, uh, and wasn't it Sonia who gave that message before about the, that thing that you could put on to get instant slim? And then she realized, okay, that it actually doesn't work. Okay. You know, so and she shared it, and it's a beautiful illustration of how people try to do shortcuts to get to their desired shape or look. It's, it's a simple example, but it serves to illustrate an important point. Sometimes we do that. We say, Lord, can we just bypass all the hard stuff? And can I just come to church and the Shekinah will be coming down and the blessing will be coming down? And people will be slain in the spirit and the power will be moving and people will be saved and there'll be an enormous explosion of God's, God's majesty and wonder sur surrounding the place. And the Lord said, yeah, yeah, I'll do all of that. However, before we get there, these are some of the places that I want to take you to. We go, uh-uh. No, 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 Lord. I want the quick fix. I want the X factor. I want to stand on the X. I want to do my little 15 minutes. And then I want all the fame and the fortune. And I don't want the process and the pain and the problems and the difficulty in between. If you don't want that, you're in the wrong place. I'm afraid to say, you're in the wrong place. Uh, because God needs to take us through certain things to get us to the next level. That's why, that's why we have the trials and the challenges to shape us, to prepare us for a level of maturity to take on the next weightier thing that we need to have. And that's what he did with um, Joseph, remember? Joseph sold into slavery, down in the pit, down in the jail, accused by a woman who just wanted to have her own way. She couldn't have her own way. He maintained his integrity, and then he paid a price for that. He was betrayed by his brothers, even his father. And think he said, what do you think? He said, you, but we bow down to you. He went through all of that. Well, you know, all of that was preparation so that when he got to the position that he got to, he could say, yes, now I understand what all the stretching and the training and the preparation was for. It was so that I could be number two to Pharaoh. So that I could influence things for my family and for a greater amount of people for their greater good. 
Imagine if he was just grumbling all the way and saying, I don't like this, I ain't going to take this, I ain't going to do that. The Lord, man, Lord, why don't you just put me in that position, man? I, you can imagine if he was like that, he probably would not even be in the book. He probably would not even be in the Bible. Because he would not have attained the level of maturity and spiritual muscle to be able to take on the responsibility that he had to take some 15, 17 years later. Sometimes, some of the things that we're going through, at the time you're going through it, you're thinking, what is this? What is this all about? Why? You know, we like to ask the question, why, Lord? Why are we going through this? What is this all about? Why are you stretching me? Why am I going through this? Why is it so difficult? But the Lord doesn't roll a dice with our lives. He doesn't roll a dice with our lives and say, oh yeah, today I'll just let Frankie just suffer just because I feel like it. I just fancy a little kick, I fancy a little laugh. I'll let Joy go through a bit of hardship because I'm in a mood. I'll let Mr. Evans go through something because I've just got one on me. God is not like us, you know. God is not like us. When God is doing something, he has plan and purpose. He says, I know the plans and the purposes that I have for you. Amen. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Amen. Remember that? Not to harm us, but to fill our lives with hope and a future. But sometimes between here and that statement, there's a lot of things that we've got to go through. And if we're prepared to go through it, this is what happens. Can somebody have a look again at Luke chapter 8, verse 15 now? We're going to go to verse 15. If you find it, um, please read it out. Luke chapter 8, verse 15. As for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart, and bear fruit with patience. Amen. And in this version, thank you, Rakesh, she says, um, those who hear the word retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. You produce a crop of good works, well, we know that good works don't get us into um, salvation, but we know that this is a result of the faith that we have in God. You produce a crop of works, and you also produce a crop of maturity. We gain maturity. We hear the word. We retain the word. We act upon the word. We persevere in the word, and it produces maturity. If we want to get to the next level, my brothers and sisters, this is what we have to do. There's no quick fix. There's no easy way around it. It just doesn't happen. Don't, if you hear anybody saying to you, right, I've attained this position, and ask them how they did it. If they say, well, there's no problems, there's no challenges, there's nothing at all, don't listen to that testimony because there's something suspect about that. Because the Lord always takes you through a process to get you to a next level. Amen. Be it for a short time, for a medium time, or for a long time. It takes you through a process to get you ready. So let's be realistic. If you want to get to the next level, Let's begin to embody, uh, we used a word yesterday, culture, a way of doing things, a culture of hearing the word, retaining the word, acting, um, acting upon the word, persevering in it, and thus reaping a, a crop of whatever it happens to be, in this case what I'm talking to, about today, is maturity. Maturity, going to the next level. I've kept it short like this, because... You can talk about maturity, but then you've got to kind of live it to get mature. So I can talk about it all day, but you've got to be in the experience to get mature. But one of the things that I'd like us to, to begin to consider um, today is um, just begin to get our thinking, our mindset around the fact of getting ready for the next level. Getting ready for the next level. I think we are in some exciting time to be in church. Really exciting time. And we were sharing that yesterday at our retreat Never in the history of Beacon Church have we ever been at this place before where the growth and the, the potential and the possibilities are absolutely amazing, overflowing. And I just feel like God says, right, <coughs> buckle up and get ready for the next level. Has anybody ever been on those um, joy rides? Yeah? Who likes the joy rides? Anybody? Nobody don't like no joy ride? Oh, Sandra. Okay. You like the joy rides? Okay. I don't. It, it went from um, excitement to fear. I don't know what happened, but I, I, don't, I don't go on them anymore. And the little teacup spinning around sometimes is my speed. Um, and, and that key and then up and down and everything, I get too frightened. But sometimes the Lord says, buckle up and get ready for the ride of your life. Okay. But you know, sometimes between that statement and where we are, there's a lot of things that we have to go through. And if we can just get our head around the, the realistic understanding of the Word of God to know that there is a process that is going to take us through, then when we're going through it, you won't be going, 
Cho, the Lord. Cho, I don't like this. I don't like that. I can't take the Lord. It's too much. It's too much problem. I'm just going to give up. We'll do less of that when we have a realistic understanding of the Word of God. And I'd like us to, to in, in this a few moments, Emma, and um, Kayla, you want to come out? I want you to sing that song that Moses is singing there. Okay. Okay. And after Kayla's finished, I'd like us to come together and to begin to pray. To pray against a, a, a mindset that resists progress in the Lord. To pray that we will embody um, that whole thing of um, 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 Luke chapter 8, where we read the word, uh, where we retain the word, where we act upon the word, persevere in the word, and see growth, so that we can, maybe six months, a year from now, you, you can never tell, we might see the church at 250, 300, you've got a question, I'll, I'll answer the question in a minute, and then we can still be here, uh, because we've run the race, we've kept the faith, We've gone through the stretching, we've gone through the challenges, and we can do that and say, yeah, I'm still here, I'm still receiving the blessing, it's still going all good. Ricky? Eric, um, brilliant sermon, um, but getting people to the next level is an individual thing, really. Um, in the world, we call it supervision, supervision sessions and appraisal sessions, but I think there needs to be a, a systematic process in the Beacon where you look at get individuals to the next level, members. It, 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 can, it can't really be done in a, a sermon but it needs to be done on an individual basis. Absolutely, and as I said, it's not, you can't just <coughs> preach it, you can't just preach the maturity, you can give some guidelines in the Word of God, which you will follow and put into practice. So let's say within a home group, a home group context, in a smaller context, where you can look into the Word, put something in practice and says, right, do this, do this thing, practice this thing, and see the results, and monitor it, so to speak, if you want to use Secular term is monitor. Also, you took on web before, as already. In order yeah. To get that to the Absolutely. And again, you won't necessarily find that within a larger context like here, because you might see someone for about a minute. You might be exchanging a diary date, so it's not possible to find out where they are. But in a smaller context, you can say, "Brother Ricky, how are you doing? Where are you at?" From where you're at, we can we can begin to move. So small, absolutely smaller context. The prayer serves to consolidate what we're doing and just to begin to get our thinking around the idea that it's not a quick fix. We're, not, we're just not going to develop just overnight. It's going to take time. There's going to be a bit of pressure. There's going to be a bit of stretching. And if we get our mindset ready for that, then the journey may be easier. But thank you. Thank you for that. All through the storm presupposes that there is going to be a storm. All through the storm. Sometimes there's sunshine, sometimes there's going to be storms. But we need to have an anchor and hold on to it. So let's get together, three or four of us together. And um, while well, David's prayers a little bit longer, and then we can join. And let us support each other in prayer. And let us um, determine in our minds and in our hearts um, that we're going to hold on to the Lord uh, no matter what process He takes us through. Amen.